Well, welcome everyone to the third installment of the IPM Hour. Um, today we have two speakers, uh, Sylvia Rondon and Walt Mahaffey. Uh, Sylvia has been a frequent contributor to uh, the centers uh, for center grant press, uh, submitting center proposals or proposals to the center grant programs, both in the West and in Florida or in the South. I noticed she had a proposal a couple of years ago on strawberries in Florida. I had the pleasure of meeting Sylvia in 2019 at the uh, Pacific Branch meeting uh, where we attended, uh, sorry, the Pacific Branch meeting of the Entomology Society, where we attended Kevin Warner's uh, working group meeting focused on critical research and extension needs for alfalfa in the West. Uh, Sylvia is a professor and extension specialist located at the Hermiston Research Station in Eastern Oregon and focuses on irrigate, irrigated crops, including potatoes, onions, corn, and wheat. She did a PhD at the University of Illinois working on Western corn rootworm and a bachelor's degree in biology from the Universidad Nacional Agraria La Molina in Peru. And today she will present on a response from an extension entomology irrigated, irrigated crop faculty to a new era of research and education delivery. Take it away, Sylvia. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, can everybody see my slides and can you guys hear me well? Yes? Perfect. So when I kind of volunteered to give this presentation, I was thinking, what should I talk about? And I just wanted to use my program as an example of how are many of us are responding to this new era of research and education delivery. And of course, this is because of this thing here. Let me see if I can move my slides. They don't want to move. Oh, there you go. And I'm sorry to put this ugly picture here, but I think after this happened, uh, things have really changed a lot, right? I'm pretty sure everybody agrees with that. I think um, for all of us, especially the ones that we enjoy all the social aspects of our different positions, um, all these pictures represent different parts of my program that I have been involved through the years. Uh, on the top here, they, I have one of my volunteers in one of my Insect for Kids program, organizing workshops, organizing at the extension level, scientific level. Those have really been part of what many of us do in our extension research positions, but everything changed. And one of the things that we have to do, and I apologize, but I will be using this word a lot, is we have to adapt to these new changes that we're facing around the world. And I was already introduced, but I just wanted to go briefly about where I'm coming from so you know uh, what my area of expertise is all about. Uh, yes, I'm, I am a Peruvian in the US for over 25 years. I got my bachelor's degree at the University Agraria La Molina, which is one of the top univer agraria universities in South America. I did an IPM course at Bageningen University back on the ages. Uh, then I moved to the US to do a PhD at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. After that, I moved to Florida. And I will just give you one slide about what I did in each of these places. And of course, now I have been with OSU for the last 16 years and happy to be in Eastern Oregon, four and a half hours away from campus. Uh, as I mentioned, my first experience working in the United States was at the University of Illinois. And I was lucky enough to work with my first mentor here, Dr. Michael Gray, now retired. And he really gave me my first opportunity to do, develop my research capabilities here, working and studying the population dynamic of the Western corn rootworm, the Abrotica virgifera, virgifera, in East Central Illinois. And this really opened a completely new world for me and new opportunities that, as Michael said, every single year that I will meet him at the ESA meetings, he will say, Sylvia, I am happy to see you every year, how your career is developing. And just listening to that from my first mentor, it just means a lot to me. After completing my degree in Illinois, I moved to the University of Florida. And I was again lucky enough to meet 
wonderful people. Uh, I work directly with, I hope you can see my mouse here. I work with uh, Jim Price. He is retiring now. And he was my mentor working on strawberries. He's one of the few strawberry er experts. And I know there's more nowadays, but at that time he was one of the very few ones. And also under the leadership of Daniel Canliff here on the left hand side, who happens to be the department chair of the Hort department. And both of them tasked me the work to develop an IPM program in strawberries which I did for four years, especially developing a biological-based IPM programs for the strawberries in Florida. Although I do credit my work at, in Illinois to develop my research capability, my work in University of Florida was really uh, put me in first-hand experience working in extension. And that is something that I brought to my current position at OSU. And as at the beginning it was said, I am an irrigated entomology specialist working in different crops. Here in Eastern o Oregon, it is very different than on the Western side. I was very naive when I came to OSU for the first time for my job interview, thinking that everything was pines, pine trees and green to come to really the heart of the agricultural irrigated production in pretty much the Pacific Northwest. Through the years, I have developed an IPM program in different crops, including potatoes, onion, grass seed, maize, beans, you name it. Any crop where irrigated crop where I'm able to, able to find, find funding, I have developed some sort of programming. And probably the latest of all the crops that I'm getting some experience will be hemp. That as you will know, uh, there is a lot of uh, roadblocks to, the, to develop hemp studies, but finally since 2019, uh, OSU researchers have been able to develop some sort of research program around this important different crop. But if you Google my name, you will see that most of my work has, is mainly around potato pests. Most of my publications and my experience is really regarding pretty much all the different pests that you see here in this slide the main ones, the secondary ones. And it has been really a pleasure to work with different people around here. And as I said, through all this time, one of the things that I have learned a lot has been to develop and to adapt to all these new challenges. And to name one or the most important one, which is very important for what we're living right now, it is to work with people, right? This is a picture that we took in 2019 for my team. And if you can see, there is two, four, six, eight people on this picture. And this is our current situation, 2020, where we are basically bare bones working with two postdocs, uh, my biotech, and one student, and myself, trying to conduct and to deliver all our research that we have been conducting for the last several years. And that's what the core of my presentation will be. I hope I'm not speaking too fast. Of course, these pictures here are from previous years, field days, uh, workshops and things like that were part of our daily routine, especially during the summer. And this is what our current situation it is. And you know, uh, our famous Zoom meetings where we are really transforming the way we are delivering our programming. And it has been quite a, a right to understand and to really adapt to all these different situations, going from in-person to doing things online. I guess the good news is that, although it's not really the same to be face-to-face -face with, with our clientele or with our colleagues, still somehow we are reaching out like we're doing right now, sharing information through this um, unique, different way to connect with people from places uh, from afar. So looking on the positive side, it is something that we can continue doing, delivering our programs in a more, in a novel or innovative way. So I'm, I was very happy to hear about these uh, talks through the Western Regional IPM Center, because it really is an opportunity to, to reach out to people that probably I, I wouldn't be able to connect with my colleagues in California, especially now with our, with our Pacific branch media or things like that. But again, the key here is to keep adapting. 
And in our specific case here with OSU, we, we really have been adapting. And again, I'm using myself as an example, and I'm sure this is something that many of us are doing around the US and around the world, of course. So one of the key things when we are developing and transferring in our information is to really follow our guidelines. If you go to our Oregon State uh, OSU website and you click under the COVID-19 safety and successful plans and resources, I am being very careful in how I have been planning to conduct our research this 2020 season. Hopefully we will be kind of back to normal in the following season, but um, we are closely following all the recommendations that come from way above. Um, uh, this it's uh, something that uh, I already mentioned or uh, when I was introduced, it was told that I'm here in Hermiston and this information is specifically from Corvallis. The good news for Corvallis is that they are currently at level two or where you know there is uh, some sort of kind of going back to normal. Although yesterday we received an email from our new president indicating that at least for this following term, all the, all the classes are going to be delivered online. But unfortunately, where, where I am on the Eastern part, we, went, we were on level two, but a week ago we went back to level four because in our county and the county next door, I mean, Umatilla County, the next one is Morrow County, we have had a lot of outbreaks of this uh, coronavirus because since we are really in the heart of the ag production, a lot of the outbreaks, unfortunately, are coming from uh, sites where there is a lot of agricultural activity, like packing sheds or where uh, uh, the field people are not really following closely the recommendations that we all should be following. So here in Hermiston, we are not on level two, like in Corvallis, as this slide is showing, but we are back on level four. And that has really brought a lot of challenges for me and my team. Uh, I was about to hire a couple of new people and I decided to put that on hold because it's easier to handle things with the four people. In, with me will be five people doing the task. We have a very strict schedule where we, uh, I, at least for the next several weeks, I, we are really very careful about how we do work, having no more than people, no more than two people uh, conducting a specific work when unless the, uh, the research can be done by a single person. And that, that has brought a lot of stress in all of us, I know, but I think it's very needed to be able to keep to, for the safety of all of us doing research. So going uh, from now on, I'm going to talk a little bit about what do we really do in our work and how are we adapting to con keep conducting our research. And I call this back to basis. So I have selected and it's listed here on this slide, a few of the core programs that we are conducting in 2020. Uh, and uh, first starting with a study about LIGOS landscape project conducted by Govinda Shereska. And I will uh, say a little bit more about this in the following slides. We also have another core program re related to Billy hoppers and phytoplasmas, a third one related to corrupted or viral resistant to pesticides, hemp research and pesticide trials conducted by Tiziana, another postdoc in my program, and Ida Thompson, which, who is a biotech in my program. In normal years, usually I do, I, I do like to be very hands-on with my team. So I will go and work with them when they really need me because we will have plenty of students to help. But this year I'm pretty much working with each team member every day to be able to help them conduct all the work that is basically a continuation of what we did the previous season. I have been really very limited in adding new research with except, exception of the hemp research, which I will mention a little bit at the very end of my presentation. So a few words about our LIGOS research. 
And as I mentioned, this is being led by my, one of my postdocs, Dr. Govinda Shereska. He is working in general about studying uh, Ligos bug. Here you have a picture of the, of the creature what I'm talking about. And basically what we're studying is focusing on studies related to movement. And for that, we are using fly mills, we are using vertical and horizontal distribution towers and the standard trapping to trap the movement of this insect in the landscape. Govinda is also conducting some work related to mark and rep capture. We are doing some phenology and GIS study all related to this insect in the landscape of Eastern Oregon. This video here kind of shows one of our uh, cool stuff that we do here in the lab. It's a, a very re relatively simple fly meal developed by a previous postdoc uh, in my program. Uh, and I don't know if you can see those two arms moving around. And if you look closely on the tip, you will see in one side there is a ligos that was carefully glued in one of the arms and a balance, which can be something to balance the, the way of the winds. And the box that is on the back with the orange one is basically the one that is recording how many revolutions this arm is going. And what this simple device is telling us is basically, is giving us a lot of information, like for example, the flight distance of insects. So what Govinda did is he went into the field and collecting populations during the springtime, which correspond to overwinter population, those insects that are emerging from the previous season. And in general, the only mission of this insect is to basically, since they are emerging from a long overwintering process, is basically to mate, to lay eggs, and they will die. Basically, they don't, they don't feed that much. And then he's also doing the same type of experiments with summer populations, which the mission is to mate feed and move. And the, the data is pretty straightforward. Govinda and I are working on a paper right now, which basically tell us that these insects on fly meal studies, most of them, a huge percentage of them, they do travel a small distance, somewhere between zero and one kilometer, although they could, they can be some outliers. We have one that was able to move up to 14 kilometers, which is pretty remarkable. So Govinda is finishing working on this data. I mentioned that we are working with overwinter population and summer populations and dividing the populations in females and males to see what is the different ecology, ecology and biology of these insects. And you can see uh, kind of what I just mentioned before, how these insects move uh, based on these fly meal studies. Another, of, another part of his work is to study vertical distribution of insects. And a few years back, we modified uh, one of the insect towers from one of my colleagues from Maine. And if you can see here, it's, pretty, it's kind of a cool type of work for field studies. We set up uh, sticky cars at 5, 10, 15, and 20, and 25 feet above ground. It's, here you can see sticky cars. It takes three people. Here was for the fun picture. We have more people here. <laughs> but basically, it takes three, pe three people to pivot back this insect tower. We put them next to, uh, next to uh, potato fields. This is a potato field related study. And we determine how high insects can move in the landscape. And this is something that we are already uh, submitted a paper. And Govinda and I were uh, waiting for the response. And the other piece of his study has to be with the mark and recapture. Sorry for the big noise, but basically he's testing three different colors of um, colorants, pink, I think green and blue, and Govinda is in the audience, so he may, may, may correct me. He will go to the field with the student, collect as many LIGOs as he can, he color them, he release them from a center point, and then he will go back and then he, he will collect how many of those, uh, how far do they move from the release point. So pretty cool stuff. And this will be his second and final year of this study. Um, I'm, I'm hoping I'm not speaking too much, but I'm going to go fast. He's here, another uh, research, core research study that we're doing right now is related to beetle hoppers. Tiziano Perisano from Italy, she's doing this work. She's an expert on phytoplasmas. 
these phytoplasmas are basically kind of like a small bacteria. So somewhere within a bacteria, it has only one layer, cell layer. And what she's studying is also geographical and spatial distribution of not only the leafhopper, but also the pathogen that it vectors, which is uh, phytoplasma disease. Uh, last year, she did travel a lot around the Columbia Basin. If you follow my mouse here, you can see the Columbia Basin. The lower part is Oregon. The upper part is the upper basin in Washington. So last year, she was able to pretty much move and travel around collecting a lot of material for the vector and for the phytoplasma disease. This year, for the reasons we talk about, we limited he, her trips outside the station, but she's, she's getting pretty neat data right now. We have a list of very important hemipterans present in the Columbia Basin, and she's basically doing a lot of testing to determine the ability of many of these vectoring diseases. Uh, her main focus is phytoplasmas, but also she's uh, picking on other important diseases that may be moved they may be moved around by any of these uh, leaf hoppers in general. Uh, another core study that we're doing is related to corrupt potato beetle. Uh, this is how potatoes should look like, but this is what happens when you leave and control one of the most important potato pests, which is the corrupt potato beetle. I had a lot of plans to do, uh, I have been doing this type of work for several years, and one of my master's students just got her degree in March, and I was planning to expand that work, but as I mentioned earlier, I decided to, to wait until things get better, because I, the next student, I would like the person to have a full experience about doing uh, the research here at the station and on campus. But basically, what I'm planning to do in the future is to focus a lot on studying the res materi resistant material for CPV control for the basin. Another piece that we have been doing, and I would like to continue in 2021, we didn't do it this year because of the reasons I mentioned before, is to focus on biological control. Uh, this is really cool stuff. And you can see here a larvae of the corrupted beetle, and you see a fly that, for somebody who doesn't have much experience, look like a common fly, but this is a dakini fly, which, are uh, one of the only tachyne flies that go after this corrupted beetle. So hopefully well, my new student next year will be working more on this piece. And uh, just one picture to tell you, as I mentioned, I uh, have been working on hemp. This is my first year working on hemp. It has been really challenging because uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to repeat the same reasons, but my technician and I and one of the students have been learning really because there's no much, there's a lot of information com coming regarding hemp research comes mainly from Colorado or other states where they are way ahead of Canada. And they are way ahead of us doing this kind of research. So for us, this will be our first full year of research regarding hemp. Um, hopefully we will be successful. This year has been crazy all over. We have had years, we have had days with a lot of heat, which is good for this crop, but we have had a ton of winds, wind, a lot of wind until even yesterday. And that's very unusual. Usually we have wind ends around sometimes in May, and we are already in August. But we do what we can. Uh, again, it has, I think all of us are still longing those days where we can mix and meet our colleagues, organize our different uh, meetings. This is our last picture of one of the things that are organized with the ESA, which is our Latin Hispanic Symposium, that this year will be virtual. So let's see how it goes. And it's really a time of adaptation, I guess, for all of us, and to be creative in how we reach out our audience, how do we keep connecting with our um, colleagues, with our clientele, and uh, I hope I didn't go too long, um, but yeah. if you have any questions anytime, I'm here. And yeah, stay safe, everybody. Thanks, Sylvia. Oh, am I muted? Yeah, no, thanks, Sylvia. Um, let's see, Steve, do we have any time for questions? If we go over a few minutes, we can have a few questions. 
Okay. Are there any questions for Sylvia? I have one question if nobody else has one. Go ahead. So um, one thing that has been a big initiative for the federal government, as well as many of the state um, agriculture, uh, you know, um, departments of agriculture, excuse me, um, is rural broadband and getting access to, um, you know, for rural communities, farming communities, many communities that don't have um, sort of consistent access to internet um, getting getting them access, and we certainly have some of our research and education centers in California that have limited or spotty um, coverage from uh, you know certainly broadband, um, even cellular service in some cases. I'm wondering, is that much of an issue when you're delivering your content from Hermiston? Is is access to internet? Is that can that be an issue, or is that not an issue? I don't think it's an issue really. Um... I don't know if you have been here, but hopefully in the future, you guys can come and visit me. Our growers are very innovative. Um, they have all the facilities to be able to connect. What is What I found it difficult right now is to connect life with them just because like, I gave an example about for my research extension perspective, but I'm pretty sure they are facing the same issues with the labor how to handle the current situations and so forth. So it has been very challenging to connect with them right away, just because they are overreaching. I mean, they are spreading themselves to think, trying to cover all what they cannot with how they usually do. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. and, uh, but to be able to access to our, the way we provide information, I don't think that will be our issue for growers in my area. Okay. All right. Thanks, Sylvia. Any any other questions for Sylvia? Uh, I guess I should have checked the chat, but I, no, I don't see anything in the chat. All right. I, I just want to just just to finish my initial comment. Um, you know, it seems to me that even though we are again here where I am, we went back to basis because of the outbreaks of the of the coronavirus here. So we are not allowed to come, come to work unless you have a special permit. You know, that's a problem. I'm in my office because I, I am here talking to you guys, but I, I'm working from home. But trust me, it seems that our work has triplicate or quadruplicate because now since growers know that we are not open for business as usual, they text me, they call me, they email me. And I feel that we're, I'm working much more than I usually do. Mm -hmm. It is honestly right now almost 24 seven. And it's it has been challenging. Plus, of course, being at home, having the kids at home and things like that is just, I mean, this is really a strange time for everybody, I'm sure. Okay. Thanks, Sylvia. All right, next presenting is Walt Mahaffey. Uh, Walt has worked for many years on building weather monitoring systems used to model uh, pest dynamics in the West. He was the lead for uh, several several of the center working groups uh, focused, or it's actually just one group, but it ran for several years, uh, focused on decision support tools that uh, were used for modeling pest dynamics. Um, sorry, decision support tools that model pest dynamics uh, based on climate data. Uh, I met Walt in uh, 2016 when we were uh, both attending the working group meeting in California. Uh, that group meeting was um, building a proposal to connect several regional efforts um, uh, based on this pest modeling on climate data into one big national effort. Uh, Walt is a research plant pathologist at USDA ARS in Corvallis, Oregon. He completed a PhD looking at the effect of biocontrol agents on soil microbial communities and a bachelor's degree in microbiology, both at Auburn. Today, Walt's going to be talking about finding needles in a haystack, inoculum monitoring as a decision aid, question mark. Walt? All right, can everybody see my um, title slide, I hope? If not, I'm going to just jump right in and get going. So just to give you an idea about why I'm working on grapes, 
and the Western U.S. is 98 to 99% of the grape production in the U.S. And that is an almost $5 billion commodity at farm gate value. In addition, there's about $220 billion of economic impact associated with largely the wine side of the industry, wine tourism, wine sales. But for the Western US, powdery mildew is the most significant threat to production. So much of a threat that it's been attributed that 95% of grape yield is attributed to fungicide use to manage grape powdery mildew. And 78% of pesticide use in grape production is for powdery mildew. But the real problem is, is that 3% infection can result in crop rejection from many of the wineries. So how does a grower manage this? The problem is we are dealing with an obligate parasite. And it's an ectobiotroph, meaning it spends the majority of its life on the plant or leaf surface. It grows much like a strawberry plant, it puts down a root, runners along, puts down another root, and continues to run her along, and then it fruits above. And it has the capacity for 35 generations in a single season. It's about every five to seven days that a um, generation can occur. Well, growers are often trying to use knowledge of disease progression to make management decisions. But the problem is, if this is your vineyard, where do you look? How do you do it? How do you cover this type of ground to find something that is so small? And let me actually give you an idea of the size of the problem. We're gonna assume one micrometer is one meter. That means over here, this is Napa. This tiny little red dot would be a single spore. Whereas the middle picture here is showing the average grape leaf size, the entire Bay Area. And then if we were to scale it up to one hectare, this is what we'd be looking at. We'd be out in outer space somewhere looking at the earth, trying to figure out where that tiny little red dot is. Now the odds are against us actually find it, particularly these pink dots right here on the, on the um, green square represent a 0.1% disease infection, which is typical of what we think is occurring early in the epidemic, just after the overwintering inoculum has reinfected the green tissue. So, and we have, and I'll show you here in a minute, but we know the disease is aggregated and it stays aggregated to these initial infections, and it stays localized near the codon, cordons. So if we look at this, Later in the season, as it develops, the red squares are just a 1% disease vine infection. That's not getting into how much disease is on the leaf. But the problem is by June, we have 20 spurs per vine, two shoots per spur, eight leaves per shoot, 360 leaves per vine, or we've got over a million leaves in a hectare. How are we going to scout this? How are we going to find that powdery mildew colony that we can visually see? And over here on the left are two graphs showing you for 100 rows and 400 rows, just the probability of detection, that 1% disease vine, is actually extremely low. And this is using a transect. And a transect would be one of these yellow lines. And it's two, four, or six for the blue, green, or pink. And giving you the probabilities if you stop at 20 vines or at 40 vines, 60 vines, you can see that the probability of actually detecting disease is quite low. So this is why growers tend to not even worry about how much incidence out there and they're a completely prophylactic program. Problem is, we do occasionally find disease and that usually freaks growers out. They act very fast and often overreact. So the question is, can we improve the odds of detection while reducing the amount of time? If we look at traditionally how disease is monitored, it's largely spectral-based, visual. Although now we're getting to some of the hyperspectral and um, computer-aided. But there's this whole area of dispersion of where the pathogen propagule is moving through the air that we're not really utilizing. So how do we detect this? How do we detect that tiny little spore? 
And the question is, how do we keep the cost down with something that we can afford? If we look at spore morphology, and I should say this began as a project in collaboration with Gary Grove at Washington State University. I, at the time, was working on hops and grape powdery mildew, and Gary was working on grape powdery mildew, and we kind of joined up and approached how do we start monitoring inoculum. Well, at the time, there was these two methods. Use a rotor rod impaction sampler or these Burkhard samplers. Both give you about 20, 10 to 20 liters of air sampling per minute. Problem is, these are powdery mildew spores. One of them here is great powdery mildew. I honestly can't quite remember which one. And I can tell you when they're on one of these devices, visually, once they start to shrivel up, they all look the same. And there's really no way to distinctly do it. So one of the first things we did because of the price tag that associated with these samplers is we started building our own. Um, some people say I'm a closet engineer. I like to tinker around with equipment. And those are some of the designs that we're working with. And this is our current design that's actually deployed out in the field. And if anybody's interested, we actually have a how-to build. They're about $100, $150 worth of parts and another $100 to $150 worth of labor to build. But Jennifer, working on her master's, actually demonstrated that using just PCR for the ITS region, we could detect the ascospore release events early in the season and then have a gap where we didn't have any signs of powdery mildew. And then once it entered the conidial phase, that we would again start to have detection. Well, to Gary and I, this indicated that the probability we might be able to use this to help growers understand when to initiate their um, fungicide program. This largely stems from the fact that this graph is trying to show. If you look right here, this triangle is when we were predicting ascospore release based on the Google Thomas model. And the yellow is the year. The triangle here is predicted ascospore release. The square is when bud break occurred. And then the diamond is when we actually found the inoculum out in the field. What you can notice here that we often have predicted ascospore release to begin long before we have susceptible green tissue. And even further than when we actually find disease out in the field. This indicated that there was this window of using this information to significantly help growers reduce their fungicide use program. And in order to do this, we, one, wanted to simplify out um, the process of identifying whether the inoculum was, so we developed a quantitative PCR. Um, we showed that this system was, could detect a single canidium 80% of the time, and that we could accurately quantify concentrations of spores greater than 10 canidia per sample rod. And then the next question became, where do we place traps? What part of the vineyard? How do we determine to locate it? Do we locate it near the ground, at the end of an end post? And even one year, hired a bunch of undergrad to drive an ATV through vineyards as fast as they possibly could. That was an easy year for recruiting undergrads. But none of this actually worked that well, except for where we place traps always at the areas of high plant vigor, or where the grower noticed that year after year, this is where powdery mildew occurred. One of the questions we kept asking growers, would you make a pesticide or a fungicide application based on this information? And they were all quite reluctant to even consider the idea. So how do we get growers to act on this information? Well, our approach was during these experiments to show, to figure out where to place traps, was to actually just give the growers the data. We were sampling every three to four days, and we just started every time we were out in the field, we gave the, the growers both our scouting data as well as the spore concentration data that we were collecting from the sites. Didn't ask them to do anything other than look at it. After a couple of years, several growers became interested in the idea about using this as a decision aid. How do I use this as a tool? 
So we started looking at this, applying it on a commercial scale. This just describes a quick rundown of qPCR procedure. Um, but we went out in the grower fields and we split blocks up into two, where one they managed and then two they held back applications until we had deto um, detection. If you look here, this is an indication, the red is no detection. Green is when we had a detection event during the sample windows. The pink diamonds indicate pesticide applications occurred. If they are outlined in this turquoise blue, that is one that didn't occur in the inoculum monitoring block. And then at the end of the season, here's the disease levels on the fruit that the grower was harvesting. If you notice, we did have one field that we had a difference. Most of the time, there really wasn't a difference in the disease levels or even the inoculum that was detected. We would have some fields like this. This shows some of the heterogeneity and the aggregate nature of the disease in this, uh, of powdery mildew in fields because the blue here actually at the end of the season, really not much of a difference in disease. And then here's another field where we came into bloom and I couldn't take it anymore. My ulster was getting to me and I told them they had to spray, regardless of what the inoculum. Um, this particular grower actually decided this year, well, I'm a continue and not spray. So you really saved all fungicide applications. And I know of one vineyard in Napa that hasn't made an application in some of their blocks since 2013. But in working with this, growers became a lot more accepting of it. But one of their concerns was the cost of doing this in the lab setting. So we developed a procedure called loop-mediated isothermal amplification. Um, this was developed in Japan. We just adapted it for powdery mildew and grapes. And we actually had growers perform this detection method at their desk. Some of them did it at Kenshin Sink. One actually did it in a tractor shed. And they did the inoculum monitoring themselves. We gave them blind samples from zero to a thousand um, canidia. And they were about 65 to 80% accurate at 10 spores or less and they were 100% accurate when the samples were 100. And you can see in the lab, we were always able to detect it. And when we look at this from a true positive to false positive based on lab versus grower, the growers didn't do as well out in the field. And we attributed this to based on an uneasiness and making that qualitative decision on whether there was this precipitate or not. Um, we added, started adding chlorophyll, fours, all kinds of other things to help the grower in it. And there was still a tendency to say there was positive um, amplification when there really wasn't. But what we showed over here with um, the spray program and the initiation over the several years of doing this is that on average, by waiting till we had inoculum detection, we saved about 2.5 fungicide applications in their early spring each year. Well, growers were also kind of, they liked this idea of this number and looking at it. And one of our growers, Di Crisp, you may have heard of him, um, an incredibly innovative grower, started using the information to shorten and extend application windows, much to my dismay when he told me two years after he had started the project. Um, and what we found in total in looking at this, both to initiate and to um, <clears throat> adapt application windows, was that we saved on average over a six year period about 3.8 fungicide applications with our growers. And this accounted for about $350 to $600 per hectare in savings of fungicide applications but it also resulted in about six kilos per hectare less fungicide applied. And this is just some of the um, publications that we put out on this. And overall this, we saw very little difference between our modified interval program or our um, using inoculum as a decision aid compared to what the grower standards were. 
this uh, these procedures are now commercially available from coastal viticultural consultants. They actually were the first on board. They started with working with us in 2009 and have, I think, over 300 stations deployed in the Napa Valley area. Um, Revolution Crop Consultants, a &L Crop Solutions, and Agri-Analysis all offer the um, service of the inocular pattern mildew spore quantification. And where we are now is, this is the grad student, Sarah Lauder. Um, we're actually using a different technique. Sarah has started working on monitoring for fungicide resistance. One of the things that she's come up with is that we have all these workers going through vineyards and they're handling the foliage quite a bit. Can we use their gloves as the collector? And I'll rerun this video down here. So what Sarah has shown is that using bare hands, gloves, all kinds of different materials, that at the end of a row, you can use this cotton swab, swab the gloves off, and we'll process it and look for the number of spores that are on there. And here is showing you the orange is the worker path, where you have this little diamond at the end, um, I mean star at the end, that indicates the commercial swab, so we swab the workers' hands here. Here's one where we let them go down two rows before swabbing their hands. Usually two or three rows were allowed. Um, these dots are where we stopped at a vine, looked at 30 leaves, counted the number of colonies, and then moved on. And then at the end, we swabbed our hands and did it. And what we've shown is that this glove swab technique actually works rather well. Um, here's the leaf swab, basically only detecting, looking at leaves that we visually saw mildew on, and you can see it's relatively insensitive compared to both the glove and the commercial swab. They're far more sensitive to detecting disease at low levels. And then what we can also do with this is we can use that DNA to look at whether fungicide resistance is there. This data is actually for looking at the um, BRAC11 fungicides, the, uh, the G143A mutation associated with fungicide resistance against BRAC11 or strobulorins or QOIs. What Sarah showed is that the visual detection, we're actually pretty weak compared to the glove detection. And we've gone back many times and increased the sampling frequency when we have a positive glove. And eventually we find the mildew colony somewhere around it most of the time. But Sarah also compared the glove sampling to the um, swab sampling. And what we did was we'd go into a block, have these transects, and at the end we would swab hands. We'd have a spore trap in this block, and we would look at it individual rows and um, aggregate. And I'll show you some of the data for this. Here's where we looked at just the trap compared to the trap row glove swab. And we have basically a fairly good representation. It's about 68% accuracy. Um, where we looked at the opposite rows or each of the rows compared to it. So one to one here. And again, it's about the same probability. It's about a 65% accuracy rate. Now, when we aggregate all the rows together and we use that information to compare to what the trap is, we see that we come up with something very similar to the visual where we still have the trap underrepresenting compared to the glove. So what we've concluded from all this work is that the glove sample is far more representative when we aggregate several rows together from a block, it represents more. Because we have to remember is that a spore trap only represents the area that's upwind of it. And that's where we've been doing work on turbulence and canopy architecture and microclimate to understand how spore plumes form and how they can disperse the pathogen across a vineyard with the idea of eventually Let's, whoops, the slide's always a little jumpy. But the idea eventually of actually developing a risk forecasting model that is spatially explicit based on the disease data and uh, that we're feeding it. So here we would take the microclimate 
and the weather and forecast data that we have from a regional basis and any microclimate data that we have derived from that area. Um, we would apply some of these models for downscaling this data that we've been developing over the years and information that we have on disease scouting, say from a compaction trap. From that, we can backcast where the disease came from. You could send scouts to either confirm it, and then we can actually forward cast. What's the area that's at risk for disease? And you can imagine in a region like um, the Willamette Valley of Oregon, where we have long rainy periods during the early season, that when a grower does have a window to get on a tractor to start their fungicide application, guarantee you they would like to know where in their vineyard they would get the biggest bang for the buck. And that's what we're looking at. Um, this is just all the people in the last five years that have come through my group and that have collaborated in various aspects on this project. But most of all, I have to um, thank funding for the research that you've seen here, and that's from the Washington Wine Commission, um, Oregon Wine Board, American Vineyard Foundation, Washington State Wine, ERAF Foundation, Northwest Small Fruit Center, um, SCRI, and the National Grape Research Alliance. And with that, questions? So, Walt, I'm not really sure what to make of that um, that last slide. That is actually a porta potty um, provider out in the Walla Walla area. And when I was just in a vineyard, I had to take a picture. <laughs> I thought maybe that was your backup plan in case this research thing doesn't work out. Uh, well, that's still up in the air, I think. <laughs> Any questions for Walt? I have a question. It's about the trap spores. So is yeah. that widely used or because of the cost is something that growers don't have not adapted? Um, no, growers, there's 300, over 300 commercial traps in the Napa Valley alone. Um, it's been expanding with several other providers into the St. Louis Obispo area to um, uh, the um, Russian River Valley in Oregon. Uh, there is actually a cooperative of growers that have gotten together and they determine where to put a group of about 20 traps based on what they perceive would be the sentinel areas for the season kind of based on the season last year. And then this large group of growers, some pay more if they really want the trap in their particular vineyard. Otherwise it's located based on a group decision. Um, but there's probably 20 traps that go out, but about 50 or 60 growers that are contributing to provide or to pay the cost of monitoring those. And that's with, um, revolution crop consultants or yeah that's doing that mm -hmm. so we've we've handed that off five years six years ago to commercial entities for actually the spore trapping component and we've worked with other groups um, with cucurbit powdery mildews, very uh, turf grass disease, downy mildews. Uh, we're using it now for monitoring for botrytis and looking at botrytis resistance in different areas. Um, I was just working with um, late leaf spot on peanuts, a group. And we've been expanding, working with many different groups to expand it. So how do you provide that information back to the growers? Is that like a newsletter or something like that? I guess well, it, I'm asking you because here we do something similar. I'm in charge of the trapping network for potato pests in Eastern Oregon. And in the summer, we send a newsletter weekly to so they get their information. Although ours is 
I call it an alert system because I do encourage the growers to, you know, set as many traps as they can and have their own people running them. You know, there's a cost involved, obviously. Yeah. When we first started, um, growers were adamant that their data was given to them, only them. So we either called them, text them, or emailed it to them. After a while, we found that grower A was sharing it with grower C, and C was sharing it with G, and G was sharing it with B, who shared all of something. And eventually, it was all being shared around. And they've actually now, when we before we commercially or let commercial entities go in it, the growers were actually adamant that all of it be shared because they draw they drew the conclusion and I mean we completely agree with them that the individual trap had 10% of the value of the aggregate and so they became far more interested in what was happening on a in their situation in relation to the aggregate or the regional basis and mm -hmm. that's why that co-op is actually operating is everybody gets all the data um, we've played around with various formats right now um, Google pens Google Maps with pens work quite well to give the information um, we're working on a project right now it's part of our frame SCRI which is uh, fungicide resistant assessment mitigation and extension Michelle Moyer is the lead on it mm -hmm that we're actually looking at a way of anonymizing this type of data but giving quantitative information so upscaling it from these points so that you can't identify where the data originated and a lot of the gis statistics that you would deploy you can still if you know what you're doing go in and figure out where the data points were so we're looking at ways of hiding that behind um, some ways of interpolating or differentially interpolating using a combination of the spore number, microclimate, and vineyard density in the regions so that we would have a visual information ultimately what we're working on is actually developing this into really a heads up type display we started this when google glass first came out of looking at the idea of can we have this information projected up as they're scanning their vineyards mm -hmm. and we can do some of this with an ipad where they can hold it up like that. All righty. Uh, Steve, anything else that we want to? Are there any other oh, questions? I forgot to turn my video back on. <laughs> yeah. You said hold it up like that. It was like, well, we, we can't see that. Yeah, we were. Uh, the idea now is what we're working with is where you have your iPad with the camera mm -hmm. and you can scan it, and the iPad will geolocate and then know what direction you're looking at. And once you feed it, you should be able to do it and have some um, virtual reality type overlays on it. Because cool. ultimately what we're trying to do is get away from the idea of pull information because growers aren't going to spend the time at their computers. They don't have enough time in the day to spend sitting there trying to figure out what data to pull down mm -hmm. and that's one of the impediments to just any decision support system that I've worked with is the requirement of um, grabbing the information or from having a ha them having to do some interpolation from the source of the data Well, I'd like to thank you both. That was very, that was a, that was an interesting hour. I appreciated it. Um, and 
Jim's clapping. Good, good job. Um, yes, more clapping. So thank you. Are you still muted, Jim? Did you want to say something? Um, we'll get this up on the website, and I really appreciate it. And uh, those are both very, very interesting presentations. So thank you very much.